All right, if you've got your Bible, turn to John 16 this morning. John chapter 16 and verse number 7. <clears throat> the Gospel of John chapter 16 and verse number 7. The Lord Jesus Christ says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the Prince of this world is judged. Now, Father, bless this holy book now to the hearing of the people, and I pray that you'd anoint me to preach it this morning. In thy name we pray, amen. You can be seated. The Lord Jesus Christ told his disciples, he said, I've got to go. In John chapter number 14, which is one of the first verses I ever memorized, in verse 1 he said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. And whither I go you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now you need to emphasize the fact that our faith as Christians is not a universal religion. And we are not an ecumenical religion. Our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ means that there is only one Savior of all mankind. That's the Lord Jesus. Only one. The Baptist Church can't save you. Preacher Lawson can't save you. Good works are not going to save you. The government sure not going to save you. Nor anything else, your bank account or what have you, or your doctors or what have you, it cannot save you. There is just one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved, and that is the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord Jesus told his disciples, he said, I'm going away. And he said, if I go away, he said, I'm going to send the comforter to you. It is expedient for you that I send him. Expedient in the sense that you cannot fully understand the ministry and what's, up for you, what's in the future for you and how to relate to this world until the Holy Spirit comes and begins to guide you into all truth and convinces this world of unbelief because they don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, in John chapter number 16, he said the Holy Spirit would do three things when he comes into this world. He would convince the world of three separate things that are so very, very important. In verse number, uh, John chapter number 16, verse 9, of sin, because they believe not on me. In other words, the sin of unbelief. Then of righteousness, he said, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. What does that mean, preacher? That means that the Lord Jesus Christ had lived a sinless, perfect life. And that upon his resurrection, he arose from the dead and he ascended to the right hand of God by virtue of his own righteousness. There's only one that ever did that, and that is the Son of God. Therefore, he established a righteous standard that nobody can reach, nobody can attain unto, except him. He did it. He lived it. He was perfect. But the great promise of the New Testament is that we can be clothed with the righteousness of the Lord Jesus. And the apostle said to the church at 1 Corinthians, he said, and he has made unto us righteousness. And so therefore, when we look at that, we say to ourselves, it is an absolute vain attempt by any man to think that he is able to live a sinless, perfect life or a life that is pleasing to God by his own righteousness. It is an absolute and complete abject failure for you to think that you could ever be good enough to go to heaven. It will not happen. There's only one that can get you to glory, and that's the righteous one. And then the third thing that he says to them in verse number 10, 11, he said of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Now, my friend, there's many judgments as it relates to Satan, many judgments as they relate to the world and to mankind. But I believe the context of this scripture in John chapter number 16 has to do with the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world and was born a man. 
And the Bible says in weakness he was crucified on the cross. Therefore, the life that he lived in this world, he lived it being vulnerable to the power of the enemy, which is Satan. But he lived his life as a man who was in absolute and complete dependence upon God and that everything he did, he did it by the power of the Holy Spirit of God and that by doing that, he overcame the wicked one and by doing that, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that he came to destroy him that had the power of death and that is the devil. And so the sinless life of the Lord Jesus Christ becomes the very judgment of Satan and Satan can no longer throw in the face of God. You don't know what it means to hurt. You don't know what it means to lose a loved one. You don't know what it means to sorrow. You don't know what it means to live in this world surrounded by sin. And God will say back to him, yes, I do. For my son, the Lord Jesus Christ, came into your territory and faced you face on and defeated you in every possible way that you could possibly tempt him and then he arose from the dead on the third day, ascended to the right hand of the Father by his own righteousness that he established on this earth by living a sinless, perfect life. So therefore, Satan is judged again and this time he is judged again by the sinless, perfect, obedient life of the Lord Jesus Christ. I just preached that to you. That's what he's talking about in John 16. No man has ever been able to do that. But the church today is in complete denial and rebellion against the truth of God. And the church today is nothing but an empty shell of what it had once been. There are a lot of people in this world, in this country especially, that are even driving from state to state so that they can get something for their soul. Where do you think all these people are coming from over there in North Carolina by the thousands to go to these tent meetings and sit under a tent and hear a young man get up and preach the word of God like he is? It's because there's a hunger in their soul for something from God. And that's exactly what's going on. And I have been informed this morning that in West Virginia, the same thing is happening. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised if it doesn't start popping up all over the country. People are sick and tired of these dead churches that do not preach the word of God. They're tired of them. They're tired of dead preachers. They're tired of dead religion. They're tired of the whole stinking dead mess. And they're looking for some life. And there is life in Christ. Amen. When the power of the Holy Ghost begins to move, people get saved. When the power of the Holy Spirit begins to move, people get healed. When the power of the Holy Spirit begins to move, people are delivered. When the power of the Holy Spirit begins to move, families are brought back together again. Children come back to their parents. Homes that were broken up are healed. Families are put back together. It's because of the power of the Holy Spirit of God. All God has ever needed is a preacher that would stand up and open the Bible and preach the word of God. He calls his men to preach God's word. That's all he's ever called for. And once he has that, the power of God begins to move in the midst of a bunch of people. Now I want to talk about three things this morning that they don't talk about today. Number one is sin. You live in a self-centered, selfish world with people that that all they think about is themselves and here's how they've been here's how they've been raised they come into a generation where everything's been handed to them they feel entitled they feel special and so therefore when they're introduced to religion they take the same attitude into their churches that they've been raised in they feel entitled they feel special they feel like there's something wonderful about them that God sees in them and so therefore they adjust their theology to fit that. In plain words, you live in the midst of people who go through a cafeteria line of spirituality and they borrow from Buddha, they borrow from Christ, they borrow from Mohammed, they borrow from here and literally create their own big salad of religion. That's what's happening. And the churches are full of people like that. 
They're everything and nothing. The church today, that you go hear them sit on their little stool. He dresses like he's been out here somewhere on Fifth Avenue. He gets up there and looks at you like you're, like you're, you know, like you're crazy if you come in with a suit of clothes on. And he gets up there and talks to you in a nice monotone voice. And there's no preaching and no power. And he does that because he doesn't believe anything. The churches today do not believe that the Bible is really relevant. Relevant. And they'll tell you that the Bible is so complicated that what you do from Scripture is just pull out little tidbits that speak to you and that you enjoy and let that be the guiding principle in your life. But as far as believing that that book right there is the absolute authority over who you are and what you believe, they don't believe that. Well, let me tell you something, folks. If your faith, if that's what you want to call it, it's no more than a smorgasbord of attitudes and feelings of things that you pull out of the Bible than your faith is, looks like a piece of, 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 of uh, Swiss cheese shot full of holes. <laughs> no basis. It won't hold water. <laughs> and then when it comes time for you to need some faith, you got none. And so therefore these people are not, uh, they're not brought together by what they believe. They're brought together by how they feel. Everything today in the church house is appealing to the flesh. All the music, all the dramas, all the little skits, everything is so superficial, so thin-skinned. If there ever was a bunch of people that go to a church house, it's today when people have no root, no foundation, no soul. And anything that moves them emotionally, then they enjoy that because that's all their religion is, something like that. So this is why you never hear a preacher in these churches preach about sin. But the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter number five, it says this about sin. It says, wherefore by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Now, I can't preach a whole message this morning. I got other things to say about sin. But I'm going to tell you, folks, the word itself, to be so little, S-I-N, is such a big issue because we all got a problem with sin. Sin will kill you. Sin will break your home up. Sin will destroy your health. Sin will take your money away. Sin will rob you of your joy. Sin will put a wall between you and God. Sin will take away from you far more than you ever thought it would. Sin is a killer. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You can't sugarcoat it. You can't make it look good. You can't make excuses for it. You can't explain it away. What do you do with it, preacher? You get it under the blood. The only thing that you can do with sin is repent of it and plead the blood of Christ to cleanse you and cleanse your conscience and cleanse your walk and give you faith and give you power to overcome whatever besetting sin is destroying your life. The second thing that you never hear in the churches today is the doctrine of the new birth. They never talk about being born again. It's all about how I feel. It's all about my latest experience. And oh, how they like to share experiences. Some folks sit on Facebook eight, nine, ten hours a day. They don't have a life. Hey, get a life. Let me tell you something. There's a world outside that computer screen. I marvel, though. And how they're sitting on there and they're pecking away and every time a little something pops up and they start running that and they want to know what did so-and-so say to so-and-so, what happened over here and what happened here. <laughs> every day they go back to the same ritual and, 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 and checking into the lives of all these people. Get a life. Get a life. I lived decades before Facebook ever showed up. I lived for decades before the first computer screen ever showed up in somebody's house. I lived for decades without an iPhone. I lived for decades without any of that stuff. And you know what? We lived better then in so many ways than they do today. These kids today are zombies. Amen. 
You know why? Because if Satan can keep you completely engulfed with yourself, if your world is no bigger than a computer screen, then my friend, when you go to the church house and you walk in that church house, when they get up and sing the old songs like we sing in here, somebody gets up and he preaches, you hear a testimony, that's not going to do anything for you. You've got to have yourself a big giant screen because that's your life. Your world is not reality. Your world is a screen. Now, some of you are mad, and I'm telling you the truth. You don't know what a church house is. You've never been to an old country church where they got a pot-bellied stove sitting right out in the middle of it, and they got a mourner's bench in the front down here, and they got wooden pews in there, and they don't have any air conditioning, and people come in there, and they get down on their knees, and they start praying to God, and God starts saving people, and there ain't no screens, folks. It's a real world that they're living in. Amen. Amen. If you want to do yourself a favor, turn off your computer and discover this world out here. There's rivers and creeks and lakes and mountains and places to go to and things to do that'll add something immensely to your life. For you can go out there and you could look at this great creation that God made and look at the stars and the heavens at night and watch the sun come up in the morning and watch it go down in the evening. Watch that moon as it rises. And you can say to yourself, my, 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 Lord God, you're a big God. If he's a big enough God to make all that, he's a big enough God to save me. Amen. I told you the other day when I went down to, down to South Carolina and I walk out there and I look at that beach and I look at that huge ocean out there in front of me and there's no way that one man can take in the immensity of what I'm looking at but there's nothing but water as far as the eye can see. There's nothing around here like that. But you look at that and you say to yourself, my goodness gracious, if he simply spoke that into existence, let there be, he said, my, 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 he could sure save my little old soul. Amen. Amen. In other words, I get blown away with the immensity of God every once in a while. Just get blown away with it. Just get wild about it. How big our God is. Amen. Well, if he's that big, then he's bigger than every problem you've ever had. He's bigger than all of your problems and troubles. He's bigger than all your needs. He's bigger than everything that can Satan throws at you. He's a big God and he's a good God and he's a great God. Amen. But all of that didn't mean a thing until I was born again. The day God saved my soul, he got me out of Darwinism just like that. And I look at the creator and his creation, and I look at the Darwinian anthropod evolutionist, and I say, you poor, blind, deluded fool. You don't have a clue where you came from or where you're going, and you've believed a lie. The double-stranded helix, deoxyribonucleus, DNA, that has blown evolution completely to pieces, and they won't admit it. There is no way that DNA could have come about of its own. There is a mastermind, a creative mind of massive intelligence that had to create that DNA, the very code of your life. No way could that have gradually evolved. It had to come into being. And how did it come into being? The creator brought it into being. And then there's a third thing you'll never hear him preach today. You don't hear it. And the reason, my friend, that you live in a world like you're living in, in America and the rest of the world, is because they don't believe in it. The Bible says there is no fear of God before their eyes. Nobody fears God anymore. They'll take a human life just like that. There's no respect for human life. They'll kill you, rape you, mug you, and they don't care. They don't care. They act like animals. So why, preacher? Because they don't think they're going to hell. That's why. Hell. Oh, these preachers are loath to preach on hell. I read a statistic. I'm not big on statistics, but I got this one from another preacher. 
And as I've said to you before, if you won't use another man's brains, it's a good indication you don't have any of your own. Amen. <laughs> Man does a little research, I'm going to use his stuff. <laughs> he says there are 1,850 verses in the New Testament that record Christ's words. Now, I'm not going to check them all out. I don't have time. I'm going to take his word for it. 1,850 verses, folks, in the New Testament like if you've got a Bible and it's got red, you know, the words in red, they're the words of Christ. 1,850 verses, New Testament, they record Christ's words. Now listen to this. This brother says 13% of them deal with eternal judgment and hell. All right, now what's 10% of 1,800? That's 180. All right, 13% of 18, 1,850, I just roughly guess about 200, right? Somewhere thereabouts. Some of you people are real good at math. That was not one of my strong points still, isn't it? Amen. Add, subtract, divide, multiply, and I'm finished. Huh? <laughs> but I'm just going to guess about 200 verses. That's a lot of verses. And this verses deal with eternal judgment and hell. Here's what you've heard before and I fully believe and agree with. Nobody ever walked this earth that preached more on hell than the Lord Jesus. Amen. Nobody, 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 nobody ever got as descriptive about hell as the Lord Jesus. Weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, outer darkness. He said, cut your hand off if it'll keep you out of hell. The Lord Jesus said that. He said that. He preached about a place that he knew was there. He preached about hell. You don't hear much preaching about hell. There's no fear of God. There's no fear of hell. Nobody feels like that if they die that there's going, they're going to go to a place of judgment and be judged for their sins, but they will. They will. That message on the Internet, on YouTube, that I preached on hell back in the 80s or 90s or somewhere, been some time ago, I preached a message on hell. I forget when it was, but they uploaded it to YouTube. Let me tell you this about YouTube again. I haven't uploaded a single message to YouTube, not a one. Not a single one. Other people have done that. That's fine. God bless them. I mean, that's good. That's their ministry. But I haven't done that. They did that. But this message on hell has been viewed over 400,000 times. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Every once in a while I get on there and I look down underneath what they say about me. Saw one the other day, said, that guy's crazy. <laughs> so I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm crazy. I'm a nutball. And here and there, you'll, you'll see everything in the world. You've got to have tough hide, folks. If you're going to read what a lot of people that don't know you are going to say about you, you better buckle up because you're going to hear everything under the sun. As a matter of fact, there's an awful lot of them that don't like that preaching on hell. And they got a lot of choice names for me, but that's okay. I slept just as I normally do last night. No big deal. You know, that's not, I'm not here to please people. But there's an awful lot of them that say that's the kind of preaching we need now. That we need that. We need that again. An awful lot of them come over there and I can tell that they've been around a while. They say, that's what I used to hear when I was a boy. I used to hear that when I was a girl. My pastor used to preach like that. I was raised up under that kind of preaching, talking about hell. CBS got a hold of that. Uh, I think it was CBS, wasn't it? They came in here with their television crew. And they videoed me and they interviewed me back here on a bench and then they put it on their Sunday morning broadcast nationwide because of the fact that it was different. It was something that they just didn't see much of it was hell. Well, I got a letter from hell. You want me to read it for you? I got a letter from hell. This is a letter from hell. I'm writing to you from the most horrible place that I've ever seen and more horrible than you could ever imagine. It's black here, so dark that I cannot even see all the souls I'm constantly bumping into. I only know there are people like myself from the blood-curdling screams. My voice is gone from my own screaming as I writhe in pain and suffering. I cannot even cry for help anymore, and it is no use anyway. There's no one here that has any compassion at all for my plight. The pain and suffering in this place is absolutely unbearable. It consumes my every thought. 
I could not know if there were any other sensation to come upon me. The pain is so severe it never stops day or night. The turning of days does not appear because of the darkness. What may be nothing more than minutes or even seconds seems like many endless years. The thought of this suffering continuing without end is more than I can bear. My mind is spinning more and more with each passing moment. I feel like a madman. The fear is just as bad as the pain, maybe even worse. I don't see how my predicament could be any worse than this, but I'm in constant fear that it might be at any moment. My mouth is parched, will only become more so, so dry that my tongue cleaves to the roof of my mouth. I recall that old preacher saying that what's saying that's what Jesus Christ endured as he hung on that old rugged cross. There's no relief, not so much as a single drop of water to cool my swollen tongue. He says, an earthly torment would be far better than this, to die a slow agonizing death from cancer, to die in a burning buildings, the victims of 9-11 terror attacks, even to be nailed to a cross after being beaten unmercifully like the Son of God, but to choose these over my present state, I have no power. I do not have that choice. We are all believers in this terrible place, but our faith amounts to nothing. It is too late. The door is shut. The tree has fallen, and here shall it lay in hell forever lost. No hope, no comfort, no peace, no joy. Can you imagine what a terrible shock it'll be for some folks when they lift up their eyes in hell? You were religious, you were good, you were a good moral person, everybody bragged about you. You were well known in your community, but you never, ever, ever knew the Lord Jesus Christ. And you died and you lifted up your eyes in hell. Don't go there. I believe hell is a real place. And I believe Christ died to keep you out of hell. And the only way that you can be sure you're not going to hell is to have the Son of God as your Savior. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to use what I've preached this morning for the glory of God. If there's some soul that heard this preaching today, never been saved, never, ever, ever been saved, they heard this letter from hell, they can see themselves waking up in hell after they die here. They can see themselves being shocked with the darkness and the pain and the screaming and they can't do anything about it. I pray for that soul this morning. I pray that you'd save them for Jesus' sake. And for Jesus' sake we pray, amen. Let's stand up this morning.